Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Sabina Leonelli. She is Professor of Philosophy and History of Science at the University of Exeter in the UK. She pursues an approach to philosophy of science that is grounded on the empirical study of scientific practices as informed by historical research, ethnographic methods used in the social and anthropological studies of science and technology, and collaboration with practicing scientists. She has a strong interest in topics like data-intensive uh, data science and practices of data sharing and reuse, open science and open data, bioontologies, and history and epistemic status of model organism research. She is the author of Data Centric Biology, a Philosophical Study, uh, and the recent book that is, in fact, only published in Italian, but the English title would be something like Scientific Research in the Era of Big Data. So, Dr. Leonelli, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Okay, great. So, well, since we're going to get into the issue of uh, big data and the relationship between science and big data, let's say, maybe we should start off by uh, telling what science and data are about and uh, how do you look specifically at the relationship between data collection and scientific production, let's say? Yeah, so you want to know about science and data in general? Uh, yes, uh, basically how you look at the scientific method or process and then the relationship between the process and the data that we collect and how we use it. Perfect, thank you. So yeah, um, I guess part of my interest in the relationship between data and science and the role of data in science uh, stems from the fact that I realized a few years back that despite there is a very rich literature in philosophy of science on methods of inference, ways of using uh, models and statistics to derive um, intuitions and insights from data, there actually is, or was, at least until um, not long ago, relatively little written specifically on what data are, mm -hmm. what role they play within research, and what the relationship is to all these other components of science that we are more used to thinking about, like uh, models, like theories, um, and so on and so forth. And so my um, interest is thinking about what data are, how they can be defined, specifically by analyzing how researchers on the ground in different disciplines, but particularly in biology and biomedicine, are actually handling data. And of course, that includes um, a research topic which is actually quite traditionally uh, being covered um, quite exhaustively within the history of science, which is how do we actually design um, scientific research and how do we collect data in a way will, that will then inform empirical inquiry, but also includes um, um, attention to a set of practices that not even the history of science had covered to a large extent, mm -hmm. which is how data are actually processed once they've already been generated. And this is particularly important today, um, given the fact that we rely more and more on digital technologies, both to produce the data and to disseminate them. And um, with the appearance of the internet and all sorts of different uh, um, digitalization and dissemination technologies, we now see science being communicated and um, done collaboratively in ways that different quite radically from what it was uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And so, looking at how data is actually being processed, curated, in order to be shared, um, very often among uh, research groups which uh, are located in very different parts of the world, far away from each other, sometimes don't even know each other, becomes a very important part of, I think, uh, what we can do in philosophy of science, partly because it generates all sorts of very big questions. Um, first of all, of course, about the nature of inference and what does it mean to derive knowledge from these very disparate data types that have been put together. Mm -hmm. But also, for instance, about the role of models and also classifications in uh, helping us to make sense of data. Mm -hmm. And also things like, for instance, uh, what is the role of embodied knowledge? So our tacit knowledge about 
um, how actually data have been produced and what kind of techniques have been used in doing that in then reinterpreting the data. Um, you know, the way in which uh, cognition is distributed in the systems, all sorts of very big questions like that. So, in a sense, for me, it's a very interesting way of looking at science from a slightly different perspective, ask questions which are very contemporary, so really thinking about what is science today and uh, what is the difference between science today and science as it was practiced um, some time ago, and also get to some of these very big traditional philosophical questions about the nature of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're worried about how we use data that is produced in in certain circumstances and in certain places, and then it has to move to other places. And you talk about data travels, right? And then the processes of decontextualization and recontextualization. And uh, among all of that, there's also the worry that people are using different. Uh, databases and different systems of classification and maybe a lot a lot of the time it's very difficult to translate data that is encoded in a way to other places and other uh, databases and using different uh, classificatory systems so you're basically worried about all of that long process that we have nowadays right yeah that's right mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so, I mean, talking specifically about uh, classification, what do you think are perhaps the things we should worry about there, particularly because we have different ways of classifying the same data? Let's say. Sure. So I think, you know, the issue of classification is one of these very big philosophical topics many people have written about, particularly within the sciences I'm most interested in, which are sciences to do with the life sciences, um, the environment, and biomedicine, um, it's very clear that very different schools of thought have formed around defining particular phenomena. And this is for very good reason, because um, different fields would look at the same thing for different reasons, they would have different interests, they would try to extract different types of knowledge from their inquiry. And therefore, it makes sense, for instance, that um, if we're thinking about what a pathogen is, people who are working within the environmental sciences are interested in having a more ecological understanding of uh, pathogenicity and thinking about the role of, um, say, different microbes within a much broader microbiome and ecosystem. While if you look at it from the point of view of immunology, there is much more of an emphasis on a pathogen as being an external agent that disrupts an already um, functioning biological system. Now, um, these different definitions and different approaches to phenomena, which so often are expressed through language, um, are perfectly fine when people are working within their own uh, scientific disciplines. It becomes problematic when people who are working within these different traditions start to pick data from very different parts of science to be able to acquire a better understanding of, of what they're looking at. So if I have um, an environmental scientist and I'm very interested in starting to triangulate, like people now often try and do, data which pertain to uh, biomedical research, for instance, data about how often people end up in hospital because of an asthma infection in a particular part of the country, say, with data about the environment, data about climate, you know, what kind of temperature was there on that particular period, and what kind of humidity, mm. you know, and data about which uh, pathogenic agents or, or like types of um, reagents are in the environment at that point in time, may actually, in, in fact, do encounter a lot of problems, precisely because the databases that they're consulting and trying to bring together will have defined these different elements probably differently. Mm -hmm. So very often, you know, there's an expectation, uh, particularly now when we're looking at things like artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques, that all that matters to implement these tools is to have um, some sort of data base, you know, big data. So they're big, they tell you lots of stuff, so all you need to do is kind of collect all of them, and then you will be able to derive straightforwardly um, some inference or knowledge from them. But it turns out that actually, because of all these issues in how you classify the data, that inference becomes much, much more problematic. And lots of checks need to be made on the ways in which this data may or not 
um, be integrated and compared to then be able to validate the inference. Mm -hmm. So that's the way in which the problem of semantics and classification tends to um, affect uh, data intensive work. Mm -hmm. So this in fact makes us think or rethink or even think more deeply about the relationship between philosophy and science because as you mentioned for example uh, people from different scientific disciplines might interpret the same data in different ways because they are using or resorting to different cognitive frameworks let's call them that and so I mean, it's simply not the case that only through building a database of different data points that only through that we can create a science or a scientific theory or something like that. I mean, in, even in order to link the different data points, we need an interpretative framework that uh, philosophers can also aid scientists in, in building up, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and in that sense, you know, it does provide an interesting role potentially for philosophers of science uh, in intersecting with data science. And I think it probably demands particularly an approach to philosophy of science, which is quite empirical. So it's mindful of what we sometimes call philosophy of science in practice, right? So what actually is happening within the sciences and is able to um, use philosophical tools to help reflect on that and then also for us to understand better how to understand inquiry. Mm -hmm. So yes, and a very interesting example that you give in your book at a certain point you write, when many sequencing projects announced completion in the early 2000s, it became clear that they had indeed yielded little biological insight into the functioning of organisms, particularly when compared to the hype and expectations surrounding their initial funding. So, I mean, this is a clear example. I think you were talking about genome sequencing and how people were able to completely sequence an entire geno a genome of a particular species. And in fact, after that, only uh, using those data, we weren't really able to acquire that much knowledge about how they worked, for example, or how they functioned, right? Sure. So the idea is not, in a sense, to discredit the fact that genomic data are very important and being able to sequence organisms has been a very, very important achievement. But I guess it has been, in fact, one step towards understanding that uh, accumulating data in that way is very relevant, but it needs to be accompanied by a constant questioning of what actually can be done with this data, what different types of knowledge and different types of data need to be put together to really understand a phenomenon. You know, and so all of these uh, claims, which were also, of course, very steeped in this long running narrative about genetic determinism um, around um, genomic sequencing or genetic sequencing being the code of life, which would therefore automatically unlock um, all the secrets, for instance, to how to treat patients and how to um, achieve what we now call personalized medicine. I mean, that turned out definitely not to be the case. Of course, what we are now seeing is that as tools to integrate genomic information with all sorts of information around the manifestation of diseases in patients, um, the phenotyping of diseases, the way in which epigenetic works um, in, in the expression of genes that may be related to um, particular diseases, all of this um, actually is um, a producing some considerable advances or promises to produce considerable advances in medicine and particularly in certain kind of diagnostics. For instance, now, I mean, one of the cases I've been following very closely in the last few years is the case of using um, complex genomic information about somatic mutations relevant to cancer mm -hmm. to try and produce new diagnostic tools to be able to determine whether a patient has a certain kind of cancer with very like with techniques that are not invasive for instance something like a liquid biopsy where you could just extract um kind of some uh, body liquid from um, a patient and then be able to determine whether uh, kind of find markers that would allow you to determine whether that patient actually is um suspecting of having cancer so there is certainly a trajectory towards acquiring more and more knowledge through the acquisition of different kinds of data but that typically comes after a lot of investment, not just in the production of a particular kind of data, 
but in thinking about how do we then use this data, how do we concept, uh, contextualize them, and what kind of other information we need to add to them in order to be able to really uh, yield reliable knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in your book, uh, when you talk about classification, you refer to bioontologies. Could you tell us what is that about? So, uh, bioontologies are a particular type, among many, uh, of classification systems used to um, um, classify data that are contained within databases and make them interoperable. What does that mean? It means that by using these kind of more standardized identifiers for particular types of data, then it becomes possible for databases that use this sort of common um, terminology to talk to each other. So even if um, you know, I'm building a database, say, on um, a morphological data of plants, and I don't really have contact with somebody who is dealing a database on um, the environmental features of a particular part of the world, if we use the same ontology for plant traits, so as the same way to describe a particular part of plants, then our databases may be consulted together. And so people may actually be able to um, ask the same queries to different databases and get answers which are at least comparable. So, you know, of course, this is a very, very difficult enterprise to determine which biontologies may or may not work. And in fact, because there is such a diversity of understandings of biology um, in the world, many of which are perfectly justified, and then there is also a lot of different biontologies one can use. But at the very least, I think um, is one of these tools that are uh, arisen through the computational age. And it's very interesting because it generates a lot of discussion, even among biologists, among the experts, about what the same term may actually mean and how it may be interpreted, which is something that we haven't quite seen in this form in previous periods of the history of science. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talking about classification systems and bioontologies, you refer to the important role of curators. So could you tell us what curators do and perhaps the relationship that they should establish with scientists and vice versa? So um, by curator, I tend to mean people who take care of data. Very often these people would be people who actually run, develop um, and update large databases. Uh, but sometimes these can also be people who are doing this kind of work within their own labs, right? So um, another word that people use very often these days is the idea of data stewards. So people who actually are um, devoting attention to thinking about, if you want, not just the generation of data, but the afterlife of data. What happens to them once you've been generating them, maybe even after you, the first time you use them? How do you then maintain that data collection? How do you store it? And whether or not you should be sharing it with anybody else. So this would be the figure of data curators. Um, now, um, the interesting thing about um, curators is that it's a profession that really hasn't been recognized for a long time and, um, in fact, traditionally is associated with the idea of the technician. You know, somebody who, in a sense, is a um, silent worker within research, uh, very often uh, receiving little acknowledgement in publications and being sort of paid to provide, if you want, a service to a research community. And um, I think, at least certainly my study of these communities and the ways in which uh, they've evolved, um, particularly since the advent of digitalization in, um, in the sciences, um, makes me think that, in fact, the amount of expertise and the amount of, um, and, and in fact, the impact that the curation work has on scientific research has grown enormously, particularly because curators tend to be the type of people that then think deeply about semantic issues and classification issues, and we've already mentioned how important those are. They're also the kinds of people that would think very carefully about um, data access and who should access um, different data and how to make different databases talk to each other. So in many ways, um, data curators these days are um, a very specialized, often a senior position, which requires a lot of experience. And the ways in which curators are then organizing databases, it becomes very, very important in terms of how then scientists would access databases and, um, and reuse the data to um, generate new discoveries. So I think there is a big question which is now being debated by many science policy organizations and many research organizations and academies 
around what kind of status does curation really has these days. Uh, should all data curators be, for instance, co-authors in papers that are generated through using data which have been uh, processed in a particular way? I mean, that seems like a very extreme proposal, but there's a sense in which if one looks at some of the guidelines now internationally available for what, who counts as an author, mm -hmm. uh, this is not actually so far-fetched. Should curators be a professional figure that is officially present in every university or even in every laboratory? That's also a very important question, particularly at a moment where we have these kind of open data policies um, coming into being that make it very important for people to mind more than ever how they curate their data and what to do with them. And, um, and also, of course, precisely because the skills required to take care of data are becoming more and more complex because of this multiplying and ever-expanding universe of um, databases and different types of tools to um, maintain the data. Again, the professional, the bio-curator, is, is acquiring cachet, is, um, is demanding more and more skills. So um, there is, I think, a big and open question around what the profession will become in the future. Um, there are some international societies now called the Bacurator Society, so it is becoming a bit more formalized. There's a sense also in which um, a lot of the developments that um, are now seen to fall under the umbrella term of data science, new field, <laughs> if you want, really dedicated to the treatment of data, it also includes a lot of the work that would go into curation. So it is really becoming um, well known and seen uh, as a research field in itself. Mm -hmm. So just to make this clear, curators include both people that create the software or the programs that allow for people to introduce data and then create the databases, but also the tools that sometimes go associated with those same programs or even in websites that allow for people to extract the data already that has already gone through a process uh, of curation or, or at least, for example, if, if someone goes to a database and they want to collect data that is associated with some sort of uh, biological phenomena, for example, the results that they get are what the program gives them. And so th there's also an algorithm working there that is programmed by those curators. Yeah, so I think one of the things that um, it's important, I think, to break down is uh, the idea that there would be a distinction very clear um, between uh, modeling data and um, curating them. Okay. And I think that distinction immediately breaks down the moment in which one really takes uh, seriously and analyzes the kind of work that goes into curating data in databases. Because the first question that is asked, aside from the question of how does one classify the data, is how does one visualize data. And what does that mean? It means that you're actually already thinking about how to model data so you can start to infer patterns from them. Now, of course, um, there's big differences in the extent to which different databases and data services would allow you to visualize data and the richness with which this is done. But I think in the main, all of these efforts are to some extent modeling efforts where there is a shift from just ordering data in ways that they can be shared and actually starting to go towards an interpretation, which is committed to a particular way of using data to document um, aspects of reality. So this is where um, it's very important to emphasize that it becomes very difficult to distinguish neatly between activities of data collection and data curation in terms of just putting stuff online and activities of data analysis and modeling because these actually are quite deeply intertwined. <laughs> right. Okay, so uh, I've already alluded to this before, but could you tell us more about the processes of decontextualization and recontextualization? And perhaps, I don't know if you want to give maybe some illustrative example of uh, how that works, just for people to understand better why we should care about uh, that handling of data, let's say. Sure. So, I mean, an obvious example of that is, um, suppose um, somebody does an experiment, say, on yeast, and that experiment uh, gives you data that seems to demonstrate that actually um, the ways in which um, 
the cell reproduces can be disrupted in particular ways and that a particular cluster of genes is implicated in the disruption and degeneration of the cell at the moment of reproduction. Right Now, um, it turns out that um, results of that kind, which link a certain type of cellular degeneration with a certain <laughs> cluster of genes, is potentially transferable to um, researching humans. And in fact, at least some of those gene clusters are conserved in mammals. And in fact, there is a whole very complex and thriving research program looking at what do we know about these gene traits as they're expressed in humans and, and what they can tell us about medical interventions. In particular, the cure of cancer, of course, which is one of the main diseases where, or at least one of the most well-known diseases where there is a lot of uh, cellular degeneration. Now, at the moment in which you as a yeast scientist are collecting some data, you may be going to, um, if you want to share them, what you need to do is you need to uh, select which information needs to accompany your data. So you may have all these different numbers, all these different letters that um, detail the sequencing of the particular material at a particular point in time, and you have your findings and your measurements. And now you have to think, okay, so if somebody else, somebody other than me, wants to look at this data and interpret them for some other purpose, what kind of information do they really need to have that will allow them to do so? And this is important because um, at the point in which you're sort of um, adding your data to a database, you cannot add every possible piece of information you have that ever have come to your attention. I mean, which color your shirt was the moment you, you know, the day in which you carried out your experiment is probably not particularly useful information for somebody who wants to replicate your experiment or have a look at your data. So you're making choices about which elements of your experimental setup are actually the relevant ones uh, to insert in a database. Now, that process of making those choices, which some people call choosing metadata, so choosing data that accompany the data, if you want, um, is, called, uh, is what I call decontextualization. Mm -hmm. It's important because it allows you to have a very neat data record where there's specific information which is formalized in a particular way that accompanies the data. That information becomes absolutely crucial for people who maybe haven't participated in a particular experiment, but are interested, for instance, in comparing the data that this particular person or this particular group has, has collected with data collected in mice and eventually in humans. Right? Now, that process is a process of recontextualization. The interesting thing that can go very wrong when we're thinking about this process is that people actually record information that may turn out to be really essential to recontextualizing their data sets. So in the case of the yeast researcher, it has happened, for instance, um, in the history of biology, that people who made experiments of that kind didn't actually record information such as which organism the experiment was performed on, which, um, you know, for a biologist would be a very strange thing to do, not to record that information. But in fact, it tends to happen particularly in the biomedical realm where there's almost an assumption that any information that can be relevant for humans and is not collected in humans may be just collected in rodents, for instance, in mice. So there have been situations where uh, researchers accessing a biomedical database would have found lots of information about the relationship between a certain gene trait and a certain uh, phenotypic trait, a certain type of disease or a certain manifestation in the cell, and they wouldn't have been sure which organisms the original experiments were performed on. I mean, this creates lots of debate because, of course, there are biologists that say, well, that may invalidate whatever comparison you make between those data sets because it does matter, it would seem, whether an experiment was performed on, on a little yeast or whether it was performed in a mouse or whether it was performed on, on, a, on a human patient. So this is the reason why Decontextualization and recontextualization is, are basically necessary processes to be able to um, handle data, particularly digitalized data, but at the same time it can go wrong and it's actually quite difficult also sometimes to predict in which ways it can go wrong because very often the point in a sense of circulating data in databases is that you're not ever entirely sure which uses those data may have in the future.
So that creates a constant tension and a constant need for researchers to think again about what kinds of recontextualizations will be involved in these databases and can we then um, update and maintain the system so that it allows for those particular ways of using data. Mm -hmm. I hope that was clear. Yes, I think it was. So, and another issue that we, we have to tackle here and be aware of is that data or scientific data in this case also has financial and political value attached to it. So, in what ways would you say that we should be aware uh, of the fact that perhaps in certain points of the process or in certain steps, uh, politicians or, or even capital, uh, or even the capitalist system itself might interfere with with the scientific process, with the production of data, with the handling of it, with uh, with data transmission and things like that. Uh, I mean, what should we be? Uh, uh, to what extent should we be worried about that? Well. Um very worried, I would say. That, that's my main message these days. And I guess um, the importance of um, the value that data have as commodities and as, um, if you want, fruits of investment by many different types of stakeholders in society um, is apparent, I think, in every single part of the use of data in research. I mean, very obviously, it's clear in terms of data generation. So there are very obvious reasons why certain kinds of data are generated and, and invested upon much more than others. And for instance, in biology, there is a huge um, investment in genomic data. This doesn't necessarily mean that these are always the most important or the most relevant types of data to um, mm. understand a certain disease, but it follows a long time of government investing in genomic technologies and therefore wanting to see a return in that investment. And also there is a substantive part of the uh, financial market uh, which is based on speculating over uh, the potential technological advances and therapeutic advances to be derived from uh, genomic and personalized medicine. So there's a whole industry based on um, using specifically those data and this is one of the things that actually um, powers um, the current um, database system in biology and it's, it's not a um, coincidence that uh, by far the most shared and um, the most available data in biology these days are genomic data. And, you know, there's lots of, um, I mean, another um, uh, of the situations w which obviously is affected by this is what kind of objects are data produced on. Right. So if you're thinking about patient populations, which kinds of patients are we interested in? Are we interested in people affected by diphtheria in Africa or are we interested in people affected by um, in a certain kind of cancer in, um, in North America? And it's clear that um, data production in relation to biomedicine and also to biology is very strongly tied to where uh, the money is to be able to finance certain kinds of therapeutical and technological innovation. Similar things are happening, uh, for instance, in agriculture. So, um, you know, like systems of data collections in agriculture are also tied to um, emphasis on which crops are um, most popular, but also in particular systems of cultivation of crops, mm -hmm. uh, which are typically, in fact, these days controlled by large corporations, which are very much interested in how to make it possible to achieve a very high yield with the same type of crop so that you actually can keep selling the seeds and, um, and you can emphasize that way of, of, of doing agriculture. This obviously is not the only way to do agriculture. You could also do a lot of research on how many different varieties of crops you can have and how they're adapted to their local environment. It, think of things very differently. But in fact, the amount of data produced that document uh, those interactions is much, much less because it's much less investment in this particular approach to agriculture because this is not really where the money is. So we see this, I think, in every area of research. And this is something that really needs to be taken into account. And the same, of course, goes um, in seeing where is the money um, that can be invested in maintaining databases. So it's not just a question of which data enter the system, but also once they are in a digitalized system, you know, is there actually money in that system to get a lot of curators to look at the data? Under which conditions will that work? 
which interests will those curations, curators have and which goals will they want to achieve. I mean, all of those elements influence the interpretation of data, the processing of data, the modeling of data, pretty much at every stage of inquiry. Mm -hmm. So, just to make this clear, we're not simply talking about the financial or the political systems deciding on the scientific avenues that researchers should explore, because we could say, for example, that if people were to put more, man, more money in astrophysics or biology or geology, that uh, what would be produced there in those areas would not be scientific, but we're not only talking about uh, they're telling researchers and scientists what avenues they should explore more, but the, they can also interfere with the knowledge that is produced itself, right? Well, I mean, I think one has to be very careful here. So what I'm saying is not that um, data produced, for instance, by um, very large pharmaceutical companies or by governments interested in investing in a particular kind of agriculture eh, are per se unscientific or untrustworthy. That's not the argument. The argument is that there are very particular incentives in the world to study certain things and not others and to produce certain kinds of knowledge rather than others. And this has direct implications on the kind of science one produces. So. It's perfectly possible, for instance, that a large epidemiological study is carried out in England, say, to try and determine the relationship between obesity and, um, and longevity. So, you know, whether people are a certain weight and whether that means that they live le less or that they live longer or they live uh, shorter lives. And this, the results of this study could be, you know, perfectly reliable and valid. But then there are questions, for instance, around um, which, which parts of the population have been considered for the study. Have people been analyzed who are, for instance, consumers of a particular chain of supermarkets? Um, is that how data were acquired? And if that's the case, what kind of social class of people would typically be customer for that supermarket? Um, has, has there been attention to collecting data coming from different racial groups and different ethnic groups? And is that likely to have an impact on the kind of knowledge that is um, produced? Um, what kind of modeling uh, assumptions are being made in a study of that kind? Um, is the emphasis here on trying to reduce obesity? obesity? And so you're trying to uh, focus on results that may be showing that there is a relationship, for instance, with intake of sugar and uh, the ways in which people then um, may or may not get ill. Um, are there different motivations? So all of these elements um, don't prejudice, sorry, <coughs> don't prejudice the scientific credibility of the results, but they may prejudice their applicability of the results. So to which populations, in which circumstances are these findings actually applicable, and also the extent to which they're used and, and, and the goals for which they're actually using. So, you know, I think it's always a question of, even within uh, scientific knowledge production, of um, paying attention to the link between data practices and the extent to which a particular claim is then being contextualized and used. And, you know, and I think the very strong science is science that is very, very clear about which um, financial backing, which kinds of data, which kinds of assumptions have been used in deriving certain inferences. And that makes it possible to then uh, check those inferences better, make sure that they're not misunderstood or applied in contexts where they're not really appropriate. And that is, makes for the better science. Um, science which is more dubious is science where um, you cannot track back some of these assumptions. And then it becomes much more difficult to contextualize the findings properly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, uh, talking about specifically the political system, and because we live in different countries with different laws and different regulations and different, different ethical principles to produce science uh, and transmit data and things like that, I mean, that could also pose some obstacles and limitations in terms of at least accessing the from different sources in the world, right? Of course. I mean, so one of the great complications about the data landscapes right now, even within research, 
is that um, you know while science tends to be transnational, so most research projects tend to be international with different collaborators based in different countries, um, the ways in which data are produced, protected, um, uh, data protection uh, agreements and laws, um, property laws and um, all sorts of different um, parameters that actually can change dramatically between different nations. And that is, I mean, is very difficult to account for because we're looking at a very comp complex uh, landscape. And most scientists are really not trained to reflect on these issues and to account for them in terms of their methodologies. And so, yes, you have a situation where there are very many complications in even trying to describe in how data are actually moving around, which is one of the reasons why I spent so much time trying to reconstruct some of these um, data journeys, because it's actually a very, very difficult exercise to try and do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just explore one last topic that is one that you're also very interested in, that is the one of model organisms in biology and what sort of information we can extract for them and to what extent we can extrapolate from them to other species and even to humans when we're talking about medical research, for example, and, or biomedical research. So uh, what would you like to say about that? Well, I mean, this is research that I'm now conducting uh, with Rachel Ankeny from the University of Adelaide. So we've been working on this together now for quite a few years. And um, I guess what we're interested in is understanding historically how we've come to a situation where it's even plausible to um, extract most of the knowledge we have, for instance, about alcoholism and the effect of alcoholism biologically um, on the body. Um, while actually studying animals which are not subject, are not addicted to alcohol, they don't even drink it unless they're forced, which are mice, right? So there are situations that um, have grown through the history of biology in the 20th century, which has put us in a position of using certain models, certain species as models uh, for the research that we're doing, which is not actually that easy to understand or justify when just looking at how research is done. But of course, um, Part of um, our argument is to signal that on one hand, um, it is true that focusing on very few species to do a lot of biological research has meant, at least for a period in history, sacrificing um, a lot of knowledge that could have been acquired on biodiversity, because ultimately you're really trying to take a very particular type of organism as a representative for a much, much wider uh, diversity of organisms. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there have been some definite advantages of, of adopting the strategy, uh, at least for a while, because what it has allowed um, researchers to do is to think very carefully about how does one um, integrate knowledge coming from different disciplines and different approaches to biology when studying the same organism. So um, what we've been trying to do is to document, for instance, um, research that has been happening on Arabidopsis thaliana. In my case, I've done a lot of work on the use of this particular model organism, which is a little tailcress, very little weed, um, that is used, in fact, as the main uh, reference model still for plant science as a whole. Um, and Rachel has been doing a lot of work on C. elegans, little worm, that actually has been used for a lot of medical research and research on neurology and development and trying to understand how is it that researchers have actually chosen these organisms in the first place as a candidate for producing much broader explanations. And also, what have been the advantages and disadvantages of using them uh, throughout history? So um, one of the things that we've been defending is the idea that, in fact, focusing at least for a period of history on these organisms has allowed certain communities to form what we call repertoires, so what we call um, ensembles of technical tools, um, resources just such as databases, for instance, types of publications, certain kinds of uh, journals, venues for meeting each other, particular specialized com um, um, conferences, for instance, and even administrative structures and even funding calls that would all fit a certain kind of research. And forming these repertoires, which also include conceptual ways of approaching the organism, has allowed these communities to really focus on how to integrate work, say, on cell biology, on molecular biology, on physiology, on evolution and development, um, in thinking about an organism as an integrated whole. Mm 
So there is certainly, and, and I mean, this has really um, accounts for why modal organism biology has been so successful, especially towards the end of the 20th century. It also, of course, accounts for some of these limitations. And in fact, now we are seeing a huge diversification of models in biology. Model organisms are still important um, reference points, but um, now that certain repertoires have been established for studying organisms and doing interdisciplinary and, and kind of um, integrative work on organisms, then they can actually be applied to more and more and more different species. And, and of course, um, one of the other uh, characteristics of modern organism research, which is now coming into, under profound scrutiny, is the fact that because there was so much emphasis on what was happening within the organism, that in fact meant that there's been less emphasis, certainly between the 1960s and the early 2000s within biology, on the interaction between organisms and their environment. Now that has come back uh, in a big way in the last 20 years, and now most projects certainly that I am um, collaborating with within uh, biology are looking at that interaction. But again, it's, it's been one of the effects of focusing on what particular type of modeling to conceptualize the biological, which has brought people in particular directions, and now it's changing again. But this is the, it's partly also why we're so interested in modern organisms as models, because they've been, we think, one of the most important models in, in biology for sure, but also is a very interesting type of concrete model, where you actually settle on an object as a way of abstracting and idealizing over a much wider field of phenomena in nature. Mm -hmm. So perhaps nowadays we have to consider including other aspects and taking other aspects into account like more developmental aspects, the way the, uh, the biological system interacts with its environment and maybe what some people refer to as a new uh, bio, uh, as a new synthesis in biology, some people talk about the extended evolutionary synthesis, for example, taking in, into account more developmental aspects and epigenetics and things like that. So you are sort of also referring to those sorts of uh, approaches, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, um, you know, what you need for really thinking about the extended synthesis, of course, is evolution. And this is, in fact, uh, one of the areas that is very hot right now, is particularly speaking, um, talking about particular um, model organisms, certainly in Arabidopsis. Um, it's, it's, it's a very big area of expansion now. This is partly because evolution didn't feature massively in research on model uh, organisms more traditionally conceived. So it was taken as a background, of course, uh, principle of conservation, or genetic conservation was very important in terms of underpinning arguments about whether a certain organism can be representative for many of its, um, if you want, evolutionary relatives. Um, but those assumptions were not really empirically examined until today. So, yes, I mean, I think um, aspects such as integrating um, a work on development with a more molecular work in biology have pretty much always been included um, in model organism work. In fact, it was one of the main motivations to focus on model organisms, the fact that it would allow you to really link findings about development and physiology with um, findings at a molecular level. But this much broader framing around uh, evolutionary biology and um, the relation with the environment more broadly conceived, I mean, that I think is something which is much more recent and, and wasn't really quite included um, in the notion of model organism as conceived towards the end of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So just one last question. Do you think that maybe something like synthetic biology or even uh, creating or growing uh, organisms or even just uh, organs or systems of organs in the lab that in the future that could also be helpful for us to understand a little bit more of the biology of certain organisms and in the case of, for example, biomedical research, taking some ethical considerations into account and finding uh, sufficiently good alternatives to animal models? Uh, of course, there is a lot of hope relating to the role of synthetic biology and, and what does it mean to create artificial life, which is actually not artificial, <laughs> um, uh, by following these techniques. Um, I have personally some reservations around um, 
how that is actually going to work. Uh, partly this is because um, many forms of uh, what some people would now refer to as synthetic biology, in fact, are genetic modification. So they actually start from an existing organism or tissue or, or cell culture and modify it sometimes uh, dramatically, but modify it so as to obtain a particular effect. And, and in fact, a lot of the work of synthetic biology is inspired by approaches which I think are more continuous with things like gene editing uh, than you know, this kind of rhetoric would suggest. So certainly the world is being and will be transformed by gene editing and synthetic biology um, technologies. Mm -hmm. Whether that in itself provides an ethical solution to questions around, for instance, experimentation on animals, I think is very dubious. Partly also because um, these technologies raise themselves huge ethical questions around um, what constitutes not even just a legitimate, but in fact, um, a safe intervention in the environment and what that may mean uh, in the future. And also, more generally, how uh, interventions such as those now possible through gene editing actually fit an economic system which has very particular ways of uh, licensing uh, these technologies and these innovations once they've been produced. So we're not just looking at a system where the only concern we have with synthetic biology is about its safety and whether it's going to be okay for the environment. I think the much broader concern is how will this technology be commercialized? Uh, who is going to own it? Who is going to have to buy it? And what kind of potential exclusions and inequalities um, these issues may create in the future? So in that sense, you know, my uh, feeling unfortunately, is that these technologies open up a lot of opportunities and possibilities. They also open up much bigger ethical questions uh, in relation to the life sciences that, we, in fact, we've had so far, certainly expanding the range of, of the issues that we may need to deal with in the future. So, you know, I think it's more of an ethical quagmire, quagmire than, than an, an ethical resolution. <laughs> <laughs> right. Interesting. Okay, so before we go, I've already referred your books in the introduction. Would you like to tell people what could be some of the best places on the internet for them to find your work? Oh, thank you. Sure. So, um, in fact, um, my main book on data is called Data Centric Biology, and that is available with the University of Chicago Press. Uh, but every single other thing I've ever written, including every single other book or book chapter, is available in open access form on uh, the website called www.datastudies.eu. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that also goes with the work with my whole group, of my whole group uh, here at the Exeter Center for the Study of the Life Sciences. We have quite a large group of people who are working on issues to do with modeling and particularly data and, and inference from data. And all of that material is available for free on our site. Okay, great. So I will add that to the description box of the interview. And Dr. Lionel, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and to talk with you. Thank you a lot for taking the time again. Thank you very much for the very interesting questions. Hi there. Thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, I also have a PayPal and Subscribestar. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Ian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervoz, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.